thing that we're going to talk about is the four steps to print. And so those are going to involve, you know, everything that requires using the computer, creating things, and everything that is initialized before you actually click print on the printer. And that's going to be a four step process. And then after that, we're also going to talk about a little bit about troubleshooting. We're going to cover about four top topics on troubleshooting. So the first one on basically printing is design and make. So this is going to take you the longest amount of time. And it's also going to take the most thought and kind of actions for students as well as yourself to enable to do. So you have to design or make something on a 3D modeling software or a CAD software. And have you guys ever had any experience with the CAD software? We're going to be using Onshape. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I do like Onshape. So it is a very traditional type of CAD program, and I do like that. So um, I also really, really like Fusion 360, and it's a little bit more robust, and you do have to go through a little bit of more work in order to sign up for it, but it is free for anyone with an educator's email. Um, so you can sign up and also your students can and they can get like three years free of Fusion 360 and it's a very powerful program if that's something you're interested in. Um, so I really, really like those. So you have had kind of, have you had experience with Onshape already? Um, just kind of in the experimental stage. Last year we used 123D design. Uh -huh. They've gone away. Um, we were looking at Onshape to kind of replace that, and, and uh, we've kind of been playing around with it and getting ready to introduce it to the kids. Um, we also have EDU accounts, and so I'm getting the classroom set up. and, and like that. Okay, that sounds perfect. So you kind of know what I mean by it takes a long time to design and make things, and that's just in a general sense. You know, through the iteration process as well as trying to create that problem-solving aspect where we have a problem, we brainstorm solutions, recreate that solution and then we actually print it off because we can pretty much do rapid prototyping with our 3D printers. And so that's kind of what we're looking for. And we also want students to be able to do all of these steps. And that's really what we want is we want students to be using these printers for them because this is something that could be used later in life. So this is like a very introductive form of additive manufacturing. And uh, you know, the skills that they get from doing design programs and creating designs and thinking through those problems is something that they'll use continuously throughout life, especially for those kids that want to go into engineering fields, or they want to go into, you know, manufacturing and production, or they want to go in any of those kind of, you know, even art, design, whatever it may be, those are all possible through that 3D modeling. And so I know that that's pretty much what our world is shifting. A lot of what we do now is all computer-based and everything is so much easier for it, but there's also a learning curve. And so that's what we're trying to help. So yeah, the first part is going to be that design. And the second one is going to be a program called Cura. And so Cura is a 3D printer slicer program. And what it does is it takes the one file type that we want out of the 3D modeling, and that is an STL, or stereolithography. And basically it's a whole bunch of triangles that are basically connected to describe a shape. So if you have a rectangle, it takes two triangles to describe that one face of the rectangle. And that's pretty much what it makes it up of. And so that's what an STL file is. So if you had a big cube, you'd have a whole bunch of triangles basically all over it that describes this is the shape. And that's what we put, put into the program called Cura. So you do have computers in front of you, and that's excellent. And hopefully you have this little USB drive. Um, and what we're going to do with the little USB drive, so it should be in your toolkit. Yeah, that's it. Perfect. And so we're going to install a program called Cura. And so it is available on our drive, so we don't have to download anything. Okay, we have already done that step. Okay. And, and we do have a couple of questions about, uh, we use MacBook Pro, or excuse me, MacBook Airs. In, yeah. um, and then my colleague uses um, the PC platform. Okay. On the Mac platform, um, we actually have multi sign in or multi user sign ins so mm -hmm. and um, what we found yesterday with Kira was that our setup did not go across all the users correct it is profile specific so if someone else logs into Kira and it's not the same one that you set it up with you will have to reset the settings and that's just for the first time so if you were to log into that account that you already put those settings on you should see them already there but if you log in as a different person, it will be specific for that person. And that's just kind of how they set up Cura and that's how it works. So, um, Are you gonna go through those setups? Yes. 
Perfect. Yes. So that's what we're going to touch on right now. And so if you already feel comfortable and you have it installed, then we're going to go over and we'll touch base across pretty much everything. Um, so this is going to be a lot of information and usually there isn't so much stuff to do in step two. Usually you just put the program or the file in, you slice it, and then you export it out and transfer it to the printer. But we're going to talk about each of these little steps and I'm also going to screen share. Um, so if you guys are looking at a computer and it's on your computer, it may maximize to your screen and you can hit escape to kind of get that out of the way. So I'm going to share my screen okay. and we're going to take a look at Acura. So are you already here at this part of Acura? Um, we're getting logged in just a second. Certainly. Um, so if it's a new account, then it's going to ask you to set up a printer at the very start. And what we're going to do is I'll take you through the settings of, you know, what printer you need to choose and what operating system to kind of work with in order to communicate with our printers. Um, so that's another step that we'll have to go through. If you've already set it up to a certain portion, let me know so that we can double check your settings and we should be good. Okay. Yeah, we're okay. We're at a uh, first time run wizard. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this to add new machine and it should, it looks like this, right? Mm -hmm. And when you click next, it's going to say select your machine. Is that, is that true? Uh, yes. Excellent. So what we're going to do is we're going to select other. Okay. And click next and we're going to select Mendel and it's M-E-N-D-E-L and it's about in the middle of the choices. And that's the operating system that I was just speaking. Mm -hmm. Of course. All right. Okay. All right. I'm going to click next again, and then we're going to click finish. And it's going to bring up our main page of Cura. And I'm going to talk about all of the settings over here on the left hand panel. And we're going to kind of talk about them individually. And it might be a little bit quick. So if you have any questions about something or you don't get it, please stop me. Please ask me a question. I would love to answer it. And then we'll also do a little bit of machine settings to make sure it's right for your NWA A5. Okay, so what we have on the very top is the layer height. And the layer height determines is the most important setting for quality. So it's actually going to provide the most difference in prints. So we recommend using a layer height from 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 or anything in between. Okay. So if you use a 0 0.3, your layers are going to be further apart and they're going to be larger. So you're going to have a lower quality print. And if you use 0 0.1, it'll be a higher quality print in the end but it will also take more time and more plastic. So for this demonstration, we're gonna go ahead and leave it at 0 0.2 or a nice medium, and then we're going to move on to shell thickness, okay? So the shell thickness should be a multiple of our nozzle size. And so the nozzle size is specific to what's already installed on the printer, it is hardware, and that would be 0 0.4. So this value needs to change to 0 0.8, or two shells. So what this means is it's actually the thickness of the outside walls of your model. So whenever you put it into Cura, it's gonna slice all those triangles and it's gonna create outside walls for it. And they are going to be 0 0.8 thick at least. And this means that the nozzle will do two passes on the outside of the walls in order to create the model. Next we have retraction. And retraction basically pulls in filament a little bit more in order to not leave strings across your object whenever you print off. Okay. So we wanna make sure that's on. And then we have bottom and top thickness, which is the exact same as shell thickness, so we wanna change that to 0 0.8. This just determines the thickness of your top and bottom instead of your walls. Okay. All right, next is going to be fill density. And fill density determines the durability of your object or how strong that'll end up being. And this means that it's going to fill the inside layers with a certain grid structure or otherwise that tells you, you know, it's only 20% full. So you can change it to 100% if you want a completely plastic solid piece, but that creates a lot of time and a lot of plastic use. So what we're gonna do for this is we're gonna change this to 5% for now, and I'll show you what it is if we change it to 20 afterwards. So we recommend anywhere from five to 25% is a good value for fill. Next, we're going to have print speed, and print speed is going to be 50 millimeters per second. This is right at the fastest speed that this printer can go while still maintaining a good quality and not knocking prints off. 
So it can be sped up to 60 millimeters per second, but you may reduce quality and it may, you know, loosen something from the, from the bed. And then at that point you have to restart your print. So that's not optimal. And we recommend 50. You can make it go slower by some to like 25 or 35. If you would like to have a higher quality print and want better looking overhangs or areas that are not supported. Next, we're going to have printing temperature and we're going to change that to 220 degrees Celsius. The normal PLA, the type of plastic you have or filament, which actually is extruded, um, is usually at 210 degrees Celsius. The filament that you receive from us has a special composite that makes it a little bit more flexible and movable, so it has to be melted at a higher temperature for it to extrude correctly. So we use 220. Next, we're gonna have bed temperature, and we wanna change the bed temperature to zero as the A5 printers do not have a heated bed. Next, we're going to have support type, and the support type for this instruction is going to be everywhere. What support means is it's where if you have an object and you say you had that robot that you may see in your little build area, you see the arms that are kind of floating a build above the build plate or the blue checkered surface. Well, what that actually does is the support will build up from the surface all the way to the arm so it actually can print because we can't print in midair. And that's what supports are gonna give us. And so we recommend using everywhere at the start and you can change that at your convenience depending upon if you feel like they need one or not. Next, we're going to have platform adhesion and platform adhesion is exactly as it states. It helps to hold objects down onto the build area in order for it to not loosen. So if you have something with a very small surface area, say you have a very um, skinny cylinder, you may want to put a platform adhesion type of a brim on there in order to keep it more affixed to the surface. So for this sake, we're going to leave that at none because it does use a lot of time and a lot of plastic to create brims. Next, we're going to have, excuse me, filament diameter. And the diameter for our filament is 1.75 millimeters. And you can actually see that on the side of your filament. If you look at it on the side, there should be a sticker that says the size and also the type of plastic. Next, we're going to have flow percentage, and flow percentage is the compensation of flow, or it's multiplied by this value. We generally leave that at 100%, but if you feel like a model needs extra plastic or you want it to extrude an extra little bit more, then you can always change this by 5 to 20%. I generally leave it at 100. Next, we're going to have the nozzle size, and I did tell you that it is already installed hardware, and this is going to be 0 0.4 millimeters. Now you'll see that the shell thickness box turns from yellow to white, which means it's happy, and it is also says, I can actually do this. And so that's kind of all of our initial print settings, or what decides the quality and how our print is going to be made. And next, we're going to set the machine settings. So in the top toolbar, where it says File, Tools, and Machine, we're gonna click on Machine, and we're going to click Machine Settings directly below our selected print. When we click Machine Settings, it should pull up a new dialog box, and this is going to be where we can change the width, depth, and height of our actual printer or what it can print off at. And so for maximum width, we're going to change that to 125 right around five inches. Our maximum depth is going to be 150 or right around six. And then our maximum height will be 100 millimeters or about four inches. Right below the extruder count, you should see heated bed. And remember I said earlier that we don't have one, so let's unclick that value. And then everything else should be correct. So it should all be zeros, auto, square, and rep rep. We should be happy. So next, what we're gonna do is we can change the machine name just in case you have a different type of printer. And if you would like, you can call it NWA3DA5. Just to keep everything organized. And then, click. so the change, change machine name is still in machine settings. It's in the bottom kind of area. Again, please. Yeah, NWA 3D A5. So the type of printer is an A5, and then the company name, just to give to you a little bit more reminder. Okay. 
Awesome. So you good with that? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Thank you. So this, what we're looking at right here is all available on the SD card. There is actually a JPEG within the Cura folder that shows all of these settings in case you don't remember them or you need to set them exactly back to standard. Okay. Alrighty. So what we're going to do now is you probably have a little robot in here, but I'm going to go through the process of loading a file. And so that can be simply done by clicking file and load model, or we can click in this top left where the little file and hourglass is. So I'm going to click the top left. Then I'm going to navigate to my SD card or the USB drive that I had plugged in earlier. It has a micro SD in the very bottom part of it. And what we're going to do is we're going to load a new file. So within STL files, there should be a keychain and a six-sided dice. I like to show the six-sided dice in order to show the fill density. So I'm going to select that one. When you double click or click on it and hit OK, you should see the model load into the build area. And you may also have it right next to your robot. If that is the case, you can delete either one that you don't want to print by right clicking on the object and selecting delete or multiply or whatever you'd like. So this kind of showcases the initial settings that you have by right clicking on the object. So you consider it on platform, you can delete it, you can multiply, you can also split it into parts. And then you can do all of those commands with each object. <coughs> so a little bit for camera controls. If you use your scroll wheel, you can zoom in and out. If you click right click on the mouse, you can rotate. And if you shift and right click, you should be able to drag it side to side. So just to give you a little bit of more idea of how to manipulate it, because um, I always end up turning it all over the place and I feel like everyone's like, how are you doing that? <laughs> so what we're gonna do now is if you don't have anything selected, you won't see the three little boxes in the bottom. So what we're gonna do is if you left click on the model, you should see rotate, scale, and mirror pop up in the bottom left-hand corner. So these are going to be what we can manipulate our object to make it print better. And so if we had a very intricate object and we wanted to lay it on a certain side so there would be less supports to be built, then we may want to rotate it in a different direction. So if you click on rotate, what happens is three circles pop up around the object. Each of these represents an axis and you can rotate it based on that one. It should have a snapping feature that immediately snaps it to 15 degrees. And so it makes it easy to rotate 90 or otherwise. There's also a function called lay flat here, and there's also reset. You want it to be the same way you loaded it in. Next, there's scale, and scale is going to increase the object proportionally from all of its sides. So you can use a non-uniform scale if you didn't want to make it proportional, or you can use the scale, and if you type in two here in the top, this is going to be like 200%, and it's going to create twice the size of the model. You also have a function called 2max. I probably wouldn't tell your students about this because it makes the model massive. And then we can also have a reset function here. And that'll put us back to our regular size. Mirror is going to do 180 degree flips over an axis that you choose. And that is all that does. Hang on, Michael. Of course. Uh one of our computers, the software is not loading those, it's not showing those settings in the bottom left. Did you left click on the object? Yeah, it's not popping it up. Hmm. Um, whenever that tends to happen, I usually close Cura and reopen it, and usually it does operate right. right. Either that or you can reload the model. If you delete object, right click and delete, and then load it again, usually it does help to show those values. Let me know what happens. Go ahead. Okay. That end up working for you? Uh, we're reopening right now. Okay, sounds good. So once we have our model how we want it, we've manipulated it like we want to, 
then we want to check our view mode. And so in the top right corner, there's going to be something with two big hourglasses and we're going to navigate to layers. And what this is actually going to show you is why we call it a slicer program. And it actually creates layers, like it says, of the model. So it takes the STL file that we imported and then it cuts it all the way along it, okay? And it cuts it all the way through. So here, the slider on the right-hand side, you can actually grab that white piece and scroll up and down with it in order to see the insides of your model. And so this is going to show you each individual layer the printer will move through in order to create it. So this is its technical tool path to create an object. And so this is something that I always like to check just to make sure the model is solid and it is going to print everything. And it's also very useful to demonstrate and show a few things. So you see these ye this yellow piece here in the interior? If I change my fill density to say 20%, you will also see the interior yellow of the model change. And so as you can see, it created it much more durable, correct? Right? It's going to cause more plastic to be supporting the walls and the top of them. I'm gonna change that back to 5%. And then another thing, one other thing I wanna show you before we export the file out is up here in the top left, you may see that it says toolpath to SD card or save or whatever it may say. But also underneath it, it's going to give you an estimated time, the length that of material that you will use and the weight of material you would use. So this small cube will take two grams out of your one kilogram spool of filament that you have. That kind of helps you have a better idea of what you will be using in order to print the objects. And you can also load multiple objects at once. So if you wanted to, you could always load a second file in. So if you want to print three to four students' files at the same time, that is completely possible. Okay. So what we're going to do now is we want to export our file, and we want to export it as a different file type. It's going to be called G-Code. And so that's the second one to remember. So STL is the first, which we put into Cura. And G code is what we get out. And G code stands for the tool path or this layer view that we're actually looking at. So we can either select file and save G code, or we can click tool path to SD card and it should save it directly onto our SD. Sometimes it'll save it into funny file areas. So make sure it saves it into the main portion so you can find it easy. Alrighty, and that's all of Cura, okay? So usually it doesn't take all that super long. Usually you load the model in and then you manipulate it and then you export it, okay? So you can go ahead and close Cura and we want to eject our drive. So I'm going to right click here and click eject. I recommend ejecting because I have had it to the case where at one point I decided not to eject and was the G code was cut in half and the printer will stop midway through and it won't do anything. So that becomes a really big problem because it'll stay heated, but it's not extruding, and that creates filament issues. All right, so you guys, let me know when you're ready to move on here. And if you have any questions about kind of what you're doing, let me know. Need to burn up. Maybe easier. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, do we still feel comfortable? Are we good to go? I think so. I think yep. we're ready. Yep. Awesome. So our third step to print is going to be transfer. So the little USB that we have, all we have to do is take the small SD card out of the back of it. And we're going to place this small SD card into our printer. And so if you have the small one, it's going to be under the button. If you look at the board directly under the button, you should see a very tiny area for it to slide into. So I can give you a little bit of a closer view here. Yeah, it's gonna be right here. So he knows what's going on with it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So that was step, that was step three. I know it's hard. Don't lose yourself in it, but that's all of step three. My husband helps me with this and he has really big hands. He would like for you to redesign that part of the printer. <laughs> I would like us to redesign that part of the printer. It's not optimal, I know. <laughs> it would be nicer if it would go in the top or something similar, right? Alrighty, so what we're gonna do now is 
we're going to, the last step to print would be simply to click print on the printer. So we would plug it in, we would select print from SD and that would be it. But since we haven't exactly printed a whole bunch or maybe you already have, um, but we want to go over the troubleshooting steps in order to kind of get all of those out of the way. And in case something does happen to your print and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know what's going on. We want to fix those issues. And so that's what we're going to cover on now. So there's going to be four different topics we talk about. So the first one is super easy to go over. It's actually Curio. And so you want to make sure all of your Curio settings are correct. That's usually the first thing you want to do is you want to immediately check on Curio and make sure that your settings are correct or how you want them to be for this model. And if you feel like it's stopping midway or it's being funny, sometimes just exporting that file again can also help. And so that's the first step. The second one is going to be a mechanical inspection of the printer. So if it sounds like a dying transformer or it's screaming at you or it's looking weird or it's creating only single lines, and what you wanna do is you wanna check all the motors and the limit switches on this guy. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of point those out to you, all right? So we're gonna check four motors, we're gonna check three limit switches and two belts. All right, so what we're gonna do, the first motor that we're gonna check is here on the side. So if I take the screen and I turn it to the left, or I'm turning the whole printer to the right, I suppose. We're gonna look at this end here, correct? And this is going to be our X motor here. And it should have a little label on it. And then we're going to have an X limit switch right inside here. So here's our motor. They're all going to be white little tabs. The motor plug-in and then limit switch plug-in here. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to check on the Z, and we have a Z motor right here. So this is at the back of the printer now. And then we're also going to have our Y motors right down here at the base. Mm -hmm. And so if you actually slide that blue plate forward, you should be able to see it easier. Mm -hmm. Perfect. There you go. And then we also have another motor right here. So this is gonna be our last motor and it's called E, which stands for extruder. So this is what pushes our plastic or our filament through to become melted, okay? And we wanna make sure all those are plugged in. So sometimes they do come unplugged and they can be easy. So, um, you know, even if it's barely partially out, it can cause it to fail. But usually you can tell whenever it's not moving in one direction or the other. The Z axis is usually the hardest. So we missed a limit switch and we haven't quite gone over it yet. And that one is going to be right inside of here. So that one's a little bit harder to see. So if you look directly at the front of the printer, you should be able to see the small little limit switch right here. And that determines when you are at the very bottom of where it's going to print. So that's the Z limit switch or the zero, right? So all limit switches say, hey, this is zero and that's what they're going to enable. So they would be origin points for those. So now we're good with those and we want to check on the belts and we want to make sure that these two belts We have one here on this arm and then we also have one underneath where the build plate moves We want to make sure those are taut and that everything's okay with it. So once you feel comfortable with all that we can go over in the next step And so the next step is a little bit more difficult and it might take a little bit more time, but it's Yeah we were to need a replacement motor or belt, do you guys provide those or? We do. So all we would require is for you to send a picture or otherwise, whatever may have happened to the motor, it doesn't really matter if a kid decided to cut a wire, if they decided to throw the motor across the room and uninstall it from it, that's not a problem. We have a no questions asked one year warranty. And so all we do is we ask for pictures to verify for our account. And then that student that may have broke it or if something had happened to it otherwise, we can lead you yourself or the student then to fix it through a video conference just like we're doing now. And so that's completely covered, all right? So that is as easy as submitting a support ticket on our website, just going to our support page, and then there's a Google Doc thing that you can actually put all your information in and say, hey, my you know, motor is bad. If I can, just get a new one. And so we'll go through the process of troubleshooting that for you, and then we'll guide you through fixing it. So does that help? Awesome. So what we're going to do now is I went ahead and plugged it in and we're actually going to level the build plate. So the first process that we need to do is we need to take it to our origin. So we need to make it zero, zero, zero. And so in order to do that, we're going to click once on the button, which is our value to select it. Should make a little beep. 
And then we're going to go to setup. And then we're going to scroll to auto home. So it should immediately move your printer and that's going to move it to 0x, 0y, and 0z. So the z-axis takes the longest, so mine's going to take a little bit of time. Yours looks like it's pretty much already there. So what you're going to do now is you're going to disable motors. So it's the value directly underneath auto home. So set up, disable motors. And that's going to allow us to move it again. Because right now, once you auto home, it locks each of your axes. We need to disable those in order to adjust the setup and disable motors. Next, we're going to need a piece of paper. So any normal piece of paper, whatever it may be. And what we're going to do is we're going to fold it in half like a hamburger in order to level our build plane. And so what we're going to go over now is just a little bit about what we need this for. And so we want to create the nozzle that heats up or extrudes the plastic needs to be 200 microns away from this blue build deck. And what we need to do is it's easiest to use a piece of paper in order to do that. Perfect, that postcard, don't fold that in half. That should already be about 200 microns thick, okay? And so what we're going to do is we're going to actually look for the small adjustment knobs that are underneath the build plate. And so we actually have one right here on the inside between the yellow and the Y axis. So it's a little difficult to see. So if you pull the build plate out, you should be able to see it easier. Right here, there should be springs above it to kind of denote where it's at. And then we also have two on the outside. And these are a little bit easier to see and kind of easier to catch. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through the process of adjusting these in order to make this build plate completely flat in accordance to our extruder head or the nozzle that we're going to be pushing out plastic from. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to line this extruder, the small little piece that you can see underneath here, the only piece that gets hot directly above that spring. So we're going to move it and we're going to put it right above the spring. We're going to slide our piece of paper underneath. And if you can't get it underneath, you can push down on the build plate in order to slide it underneath and it'll make it a little bit easier. And so I think I'm a little bit forward. So we want to try and get it as close as possible. Um, it doesn't need to be perfect, but we are going to level it like so. So I'm going to be moving my printer around a whole bunch so that you can kind of see what's going on and preferably leave yours flat. So once you have it underneath the nozzle, if you need to, you can always push down on the build plate. On springs. There you go. And so what we're looking for is a very small amount of resistance. So we want to feel a pull from the nozzle. So we don't want it to be too much because if it crinkles the paper or it crinkles the card, that means it's too close. And if you don't feel anything at all, it means it's too far away. And so in order to adjust that, we have to think of the knob. And the knob on the underside, if you go clockwise, it's going to go up. If you go counterclockwise, it's going to pull it down. So if you tighten it, it pulls it together. If you loosen it, it loosens it apart. Okay, That's the best way to think about it. So mine is a little bit too close, so I'm going to go counterclockwise in order to lower the build plate until I feel comfortable with it. And so there's going to be a certain amount of resistance, and it is something that you will get used to in time. And so if you want an example of how that feels, you can actually take the postcard or a piece of paper, and you can put your finger on top of it and slide it back and forth to kind of get the resistance. Yeah, in order to get that one easier, yeah, you can slide the build plate forward all the way and then push it back. Okay, all right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that feels pretty good. Okay, and then we're going to move on to the next two. And so those are just here on the outside, so I'm going to move this out and back a little bit and place my nozzle above it, just like so. And then we're going to do the exact same adjustment. So we want it to have a small amount of resistance. And actually, that one's pretty happy. 
Okay, and then finally, of course, the one in the back. And we're going to again check that one. And this is something your students can do by all means. And so once you teach them, hopefully you don't have to level any more build plates. Now, do you recommend leveling the build plate before every job or do you think, can you go longer than that or? We recommend leveling the build plate when you move the printer. So if I were to move this printer into another room or somewhere else or onto another flat surface, that's when we recommend re-leveling it. That's the only case. Usually, if you leave it in the same spot, it doesn't really move, and you're printing consistently on it, you don't have to reload. If something does happen, there is an error with your print, that is a time that you may want to try and re-level to see if you can fix it, right? It's a troubleshooting step is the idea. All right. All righty. Awesome. So you feel comfortable with that? So what we're going to talk about now is that was kind of leveling the build plate. We're going to talk about filament. And so... I see that you guys already have your filament threaded through. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna move my build plate up a little bit. You can do that by turning this back Z-axis spiral. Um, beware, there is some, you know, like residue on it, just to let you know, there is a little bit of grease. Okay. And once you have that kind of moved up a little bit, then we can actually heat up the nozzle and push plastic through. So by going to setup and preheat PLA, it'll heat the nozzle to 220 degrees Celsius. Notice that there is another value called preheat directly below preheat PLA. And it's called preheat soft pull. And this is one of the filament troubleshooting steps. So what this does is from a cooled state or room temperature, heat it from soft pull, which heats it to 100 degrees Celsius, which puts the plastic into a state of transition. And so what happens is it actually fills pretty much all the gaps within the nozzle and then you can actually pull it out steadily in order to remove all of that extra material or that plastic. And this is what we recommend doing if you have a small clog or if you wanna change colors, we recommend letting it cool off and then doing a soft pull to better remove that material. Another way you can use basically filament to kind of push out your clogs is to heat it up like 220, like we're doing. And you can actually feed in the filament like you guys have. So I'm gonna go ahead and feed mine real quick. And so you do squeeze the yellow trigger on the back in order to feed the filament. And then you get it to go through both of the holes and you push it all the way through the entire tube. So I'm gonna go through, pushing that through. And the other filament step that I was talking about that you can troubleshoot is you can actually push extra filament through. So you can create more pressure and back pressure in order to help push out clogs or push out an old color when you're changing one. So if a student is trying to change colors from blue to red, make sure they kind of extrude the previous color so that the bottom of their print doesn't end up a red color. And so I went ahead and pushed out the blue that I had had in here prior and I also broke it. That's beautiful. Okay, so I pushed out the old color and that's another form of troubleshooting. I'm going to grab that with some fire so I don't burn myself. I had a whole bunch of blue previously, and so that came out this time. So that's another way to kind of remove filament and otherwise. Um, there's one other thing that you guys do have in your toolkit. You have a small little needle that is actually for flossing the nozzle in case there is a large clog. So by heating up to 220 degrees Celsius, you can take this small needle that you have, use some pliers with no filament in it, and heat it up. You can then floss the nozzle by pulling this all the way up to the top and flossing it to get the clogs out. And that may help if you have a really, really bad clog. Usually you don't have to go there. Usually soft pulls will do that for you. Can you tell us where that was in our toolkit? Certainly, it should be in this little bag and there should be a little styrofoam piece on the end of it. Uh, would, does one come, does that come with each printer or would we just get one for all six? You should have, you should have two of these. Huh. Maybe I haven't opened the right box yet. It's possible. Um, have you found the blue cable? It should be with the blue cable, I believe. 
I no, I don't think so. Okay, yeah, then you should have more toolkits that you, uh, that you haven't seen yet. So there's there are, there are very there. similar to this. Okay. okay. Awesome. So if you guys don't have that, please let me know. You can just email me and we will get that shipped to you as soon as possible, all right? Yeah. All right, so what we're gonna do now is that's kind of all the filament issues I wanted to talk about and kind of ways to prevent them. Um, so notice that we have it heated up, we don't have it extruding, and we have filament in it. That is usually a bad case. Usually that can create black carbon clogs of filament and you don't want that to be. But since we're right about to print, what we're going to do is we're going to click the button once. We're going to select print from SD. And then we're going to select the file that we just loaded on there. And we're going to select six out of dice. Okay. Just heat first. You don't, if it doesn't show, if it says no SD card, what I recommend is clicking on refresh SD card at the bottom. Oh, there it is. Okay, yes. Perfect. And so that's, that's kind of a thing you may want to check every time just to make sure that you have your files you want. Okay, so you get click the print and you feel comfortable with that? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Sweet, so mine went ahead and started. So it's gonna start pretty quick because first the thing that it's going to do is it's going to heat up, the printer will heat up, then it will move to the origin point or zero, 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 and then it'll move to the print area. Okay? Will we choose one of these options to print after we said print from SD card? I'm sorry? Were we to choose one of the, one of the objects to print? Yes, so whichever one you loaded onto it, if you loaded the robot or the six-sided dice, you click print from SD and then you select the file. And it should be a .g code file, it won't find anything else. So the printer only looks for .g codes. Okay. Okay, we've got NWA 3D keychain, we've got Kira test prints. Oh, mm -hmm. So if you go into the STL files, hopefully that's where you exported the file. Usually it happens that you export it back into the STL file folder. Oh, here we go. Okay, there's a six-sided dice. Yeah, and the STL files. Yeah, so it's saved to the path that you originally opened the dice from. Okay, all right. So that's kind of what it means when it says tool path to SD. It often saves it directly to the same path you pulled the file from. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Oh, okay. So you have a little bit of plastic hanging onto it there if you want to grab that it should be cool it shouldn't be hot if you want to use pliers you can do that as well okay. and so it does cool off really fast like you noticed it's it yeah. almost immediately out of the nozzle all righty it's working its way through so first layer looked like it's going down and does it look like it's doing well it's not, it's not uh, there's no filament coming out I don't think. Okay. Or, uh, oh yeah, okay, yeah, never mind, never mind. So what may have happened was it was either creating back pressure by trying to feed more filament in, or it, the build plate was a little bit too high and it had to move up just a little bit before it started pulling out the plastic. Gotcha, okay, all right. Awesome, so that's it, that was all of the training. Okay, all right. All right. In the meantime, do you have any questions, comments, concerns? Um. Is all this available on your website, all this information? Yes, we actually have videos for almost, for all of the information that we covered just now, except for the beginning kind of design process or design iteration. Okay. So we have right. troubleshooting all of the clogs or nozzle filament, leveling the build plate, and also Kira settings. Okay, all right, cool. Mm -hmm. That's good. And awesome. you're gonna send me this, this recording as well? Yes, I am. It will be uploaded on YouTube and it'll be unlisted and there will be a private link for you to share as you please. Awesome. Okay. I'll send that on to these guys then.